All right, party people, come on back to your seats. I'm just wondering how many times the word Purdue was mentioned just now. I hear there's a big game this afternoon. Hey, speaking of March Madness, not to brag, because it's not bragging. You'll understand why here in just a minute, but we're doing a little thing here at VCC uh, where some of you are a part of a just for fun bracket thing that we're doing here. Your preacher happens to be number two right now. But he also picked uh, UK to go the whole distance. So number two doesn't mean anything right now. There's no way I can win that thing. But hey, I'm so glad that you're here. I'm glad that you've chosen to worship with us. We're kicking off a brand new series today. It's going to be a three-week series taking us through Easter and after Easter Not just because of March Madness, but I've spent some time on some college websites here the last week or two. Not for the reasons that you're thinking about, but really because of, I don't know if you've heard this or not, we have this eclipse thing that's getting ready to happen here locally in a few weeks. You just heard Tony talk about it. My goodness, I feel like every time I turn around, people are talking about this uh, once in a lifetime eclipse opportunity. So I've spent some time researching on Purdue's website, on Butler's website, on Ball State's website. They're talking about celestial things, and it's pretty cool. The series that we're kicking off is kind of eclipse-themed. We're talking about God's light from the shadows. Can you sense an eclipse theme here? Today we're diving into the beauty and the wonder of the celestial dance. That's what we're talking about. How many of you have a memory of childhood, maybe with a teacher, maybe like me with your mom, doing something with a shoebox and poking a hole in it? And anybody remember doing this? I have a vivid memory. We were out in front of my childhood home in the ditch. I don't know why we were in the ditch. I think maybe I, had a fa- I was a fan of the crawdads that I could find in that ditch. Maybe that's why we were there. But I remember looking through this box and seeing the shadow. I remember my mom being pretty geeked up about it. Skip ahead a few years. 2017, an eclipse came through central Indiana. I gathered together with some friends. Now I'm an adult. Check this out. This is pretty cool, actually. I so enjoyed this particular day. Here's a picture of me. Staring up at the sun, I'm wearing my protective gear, wearing the glasses like you're supposed to wear, right? And here's my friend Matt and I. I discovered that not just the box where you stick the hole in it, you look through and see a reflection there. I learned that your smartphone, if you reflect it back just like this, you can poke it uh, toward your buddy's cheek. So I don't know if you can see that on Matt. Let's go in a little bit closer. You can see the eclipse reflected on Matt's cheek. How fun is that? Kids, don't try this at home, especially if you're not wearing the protective gear. I, um, I also noticed that day, this is kind of wild. You might have noticed that there were some clouds in the sky that day. Doesn't matter, I guess. Look at this. If you skip ahead to the next picture, this, it was hard to capture this photograph. I couldn't get it to focus quite right, but I was noticing on the sidewalks, The sunlight dappled coming through the leaves on the tree. You can kind of see the eclipse showing up even in the shadows. Wow. I walked away that day totally geeked up. And the more I've read about this event that's coming up in a few weeks, oh my goodness, am I excited for this once-in-a-lifetime event here in central Indiana. I know it's once in a lifetime because I spent time on college websites. I told you that already. Let me show you this map of the state of Indiana. I believe I found this at the Butler website. And it shows you the last date that if you were in these places in our fair state, you would have had the opportunity to see an eclipse, full eclipse. South of, well, down in the Hoosier National Forest region of our fair state, it would have been 1869, None of us saw it then. Up in the northern part of the state, it would have been even uh, longer than that, 1806. If you go to the west side of Indianapolis, over in the Avon area, it would have been, get this, 1205. We're talking Crusades era. It's been a while. If you go east of our fair city, 
Or you go north, actually, north of, like, say, Highway 32. If you live in Westfield or north of there, Noblesville or north of there, it would have been 957 since the chance you would have had to have seen it. If you come a little bit further south, like where we're sitting right now, check this out. Last full eclipse would have been 831. Charlemagne was crowned emperor of the Holy Roman Empire not too awful long before that. Gunpowder was invented in China just a few years before that. It's been a while, once in a lifetime. According to Muncie, Ball State's website, the next time if you live in Muncie, you'll get to see a total solar eclipse will be June 3rd, 2505. Would you agree? Once in a lifetime. Don't miss out on this cool opportunity that's coming up. So we're diving into a series today. I have fittingly titled the message today, The Celestial Dance. I want to play a little bit with these themes of light and darkness. There's something beautiful in an eclipse. God's showing off. It's pretty cool. If you're not aware yet, if you haven't read up on it, a total solar eclipse... This is the eclipse of the sun by the moon completely. When they line up, completely hides the solar surface or photosphere and cuts off all direct rays of sunlight from the observer. I don't know if you know this, but, well, of course, the earth rotates around the sun. The moon rotates around the earth, but it doesn't rotate perfectly in a circle. Sometimes it's a little bit closer, sometimes it's a little bit further away because of the way it orbits. This is so interesting. There is a creator, intelligent design. If you look up in the sky, the sun and the moon appear to be roughly the same shape. This is what makes this happen well. And sometimes... The moon is just a little bit closer to us once in a lifetime to where this eclipse event, it blocks it out completely. Celestial dance. Here's the definition of celestial. You could make it about the sky or the visible heaven, the universe. This is the, these are the celestial bodies. We refer to the stars that way. Or you could, the second definition, it's the spiritual or invisible heaven. Another word to use, heavenly or even divine. There is a celestial dance and your God, the creator God of the universe, spoke the world into existence and oh my goodness, his design is beautiful and was intended to be perfect. But wait, there's more. Look at this passage. In Hebrews, the Hebrew writer ties the Old Testament create creation story with the New Testament, Jesus, what he's done, his redemptive work on the cross we're going to celebrate next Sunday. Check this out. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Since then, he's just spent time, the writer has been talking about what has been going on in the Old Testament, the sacrificial system. Since then, we have a great high priest. You know him as Jesus who has passed through the heavens, the incarnation. God becomes flesh, and he makes his dwelling among us. Jesus, the Son of God, because of what he's done, let's hold fast to our confession. I hope today, as we look at this celestial dance, it calls you into a deeper space in your walk with Jesus And we're going to land the plane with the message there. A time for you to just think about that and to contemplate that. But before we get there, I want to share with you a caution before we dive in. Here's my caution. God is never late. He's seldom early, uh, but he's always right on time. You might have a tendency to pray these prayers like I do. Give me patience, God, but hurry. Anybody else do that? When we're waiting on God to answer prayer, our timing and his timing, well, rarely it seems like they're synced up correctly. Sometimes it might seem like God is in a different time zone altogether. Sometimes we feel like we've picked one of those numbers at the BMV, right? And we're like 78 in line ahead of us. 
we need God to wait on us right away. God is never late. He's seldom early. He's always right on time. Here's another caution. This whole um, eclipse thing, can I just encourage you? I keep seeing stuff on social media. I got forwarded another one this morning early. There's a lot of fear-mongering that's going on out there. Christian, the Christian subculture, could I just encourage you, my church family, be oh so careful. Fear isn't the best motivator, in my opinion. Maybe you've noticed this. This happens to be an election year. The whole culture feels just a little bit on edge. Christians, let's be real careful. We are winsome. We win people to Jesus with love. I've been reading up on all these things, these prophetic things that are lining up, like 2017, the ark across the the, the country, and then this one, the ark across the country. You've got to use the number seven because that's a prophetic number. And all of these sevens get lined up in some city named Rapture and cities named Nineveh and Salem, which happens to mean peace. I mean, if you follow the rabbit trail enough, apparently Jesus is coming back April 8th. The only problem with that is Jesus said, nobody knows the times or dates except the Father in heaven. So maybe he will, maybe he won't. Lead with love, don't lead with fear. Be careful, your one needs to be one to Jesus by your steadfast love. Here's the big question, are you ready? Are you ready for Jesus to come back? Statistically speaking, Through the course of history, Christians who have died and gone to be with Jesus, there are way less of us that will experience that moment of his glorious reappearing when he comes back to take his people home. There are less of us that will experience his coming back that way than there are those of us who would die. You could be hit by a bus tomorrow. I could die of a heart attack right here on the stage while I'm preaching. The question is, are you ready? Are you ready to meet your Jesus? Okay, enough with my cautions. That question, are you ready? The theme for today is the word waiting. Oh my goodness, the entire Old Testament. It seems like we're waiting for Jesus to come. Next week, we're going to lean into the word watching. The following week, week three of this series, we're going to look at watching and waiting. But today, we're talking about waiting, I have three celestial truths I want to share with you today. If you're taking notes, you might want to write these down. Here's the first celestial truth. Number one, God owns a grand design. By the way, he does. He's the owner. He's the creator. The solar eclipse reminds us of God's grand design for the universe, just as the moon aligns perfectly with the sun to create an eclipse. God orchestrates events in our lives for his divine purposes. He's been doing it for a very long time. I don't want to get too cute with this metaphor, but I do want to play with the idea of light and darkness, and I want to show you throughout history as it's recorded for us, especially in the Old Testament, how metaphorically speaking, we have lived under an eclipse for a very long time. But let's go back before that. Let's go back to the very beginning, shall we? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. The darkness he called night. The daylight he called day. There was evening and there was morning the first day. In the very first verses of Scripture, we see that we were intended to live in the light. This was the design. Oh my goodness, I've been remodeling this house. Uh, I've told you about this in weeks past. And there's a couple of guys here at our church, a father and son duo, uh, Noah and Herb, have been helping me wire up this house, rewire this house. And every time we flip the switch and we create a new circuit and the light goes on, one of us does the cheesy joke, let there be light. Preacher jokes are a little bit like dad jokes. You just kind of have to groan and go with it. It's not really funny. It's really more of an observation, but there you go. The first three chapters of the Bible, we were designed to live in the light. 
We were designed, we were made for face-to-face communion with God. But oh, chapter 3, sin enters from the shadows. Stage left, the tempter, Satan. He whispers a lie. We buy the lie. We repeat the lie. We live the lie. And there's an eclipse. Everything changes. This is the image that we find that I think, in my opinion, would best represent the entire Old Testament story. If you want to take the Old Testament and make it a word picture, I think that's not a bad one. This is a picture, literally, of a full eclipse. I hope if it's a clear day outside, April 8th, we'll get to experience getting to see something like that. But look at this. This is the story of the Old Testament. Occasionally, you see a ray of light, a ray of hope sneak out from behind the darkness. For example, you got Moses up on Mount Sinai. He's only one that gets to see the ray of light. He says, God, show me your glory, your Shekinah glory. God obliges. He comes down, his face is glowing. He's blinded by the light. Why? Because he's not used to seeing the light. He's been living in darkness. He's one of millions that were camped out at the base of that mountain. Occasionally, a ray of light sneaks out. You look ahead in the story. There's a moment, this powerful battle, and there's a proclamation and a prayer to God's son, stand still, and God, miraculously celestial, stops the movement. You can look at moments like Joshua marching around the walls of the Old Testament city of Jericho. I've been there. I've seen how the walls fell They didn't fall in like as if you were breaching the city. They fell out. A miraculous moment. A ray of sunlight sneaking in from around the darkness. Oh, the the, the era of King David, the golden era of Israel. We see rays of sunshine. We see rays of light. True worship sneaking out of the darkness. But mostly, if you read through the Old Testament, mostly it's darkness. Have you read the minor prophets lately? This is not a bad image to represent the darkness that we lived under. This week, we look ahead to Easter. Jesus, Jesus, oh, does his thing. He beats the power of Satan, sin, death, and hell. He's alive. The grave cannot hold him. Light breaks through. Here's an image. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, shouldn't that be glorious sunlight at this moment? Jesus has won. Yes, but we still live darkness adjacent. Look at this passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love never fails. This is the love chapter in your Bible. But where there's prophecies, they'll cease. Where there's tongues, they'll be stilled. Where there's knowledge, you'll pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, we're still living in darkness. Well, then imperfect disappears. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. We still live underneath the darkness, the eclipse event. Jesus is a powerful ray of sunshine. By the way, New Testament Christians, I think that's still a pretty good image. Let's go back and look at the image. This is still kind of how we're living today. Some days, maybe when things line up and you see God's goodness for all the good things, maybe, maybe your eclipse looks more like this. Hit the next slide. But I think oftentimes... Oftentimes, we are just grasping for the light. It would be my opinion that we don't see the sun come back in its full glory until that one of these days in the celestial city is described as the wedding feast of the Lamb in the New Testament. Here's the image that would reflect that. It's not until eternity with Jesus that we see the light in all of its glory. But the light broke through. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and following says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. His light 
He seeks to impart to you and to me. And because you're his sons, you're his kids, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. Here's the deal. God owns a grand design. He does. Have you allowed him to own you? He wants you to be his child. He wants you crying out, Daddy, Father. The word there is lordship. His grand design for you is that you step into that light, that you grab as much of that light as you can, and that you hold on to it, that you live under his will for your life. Which brings me to my second celestial truth. If you're taking notes, write this one down. God owns a grand design, yes, but God also reveals a grand will. And oh my goodness, do we see it on display during this week, the Passion Week, Holy Week. If I can, if you'll allow me, I'd like to do a case study of two of Jesus' followers. The first one, I want to tell you about John. Look for John through this story. John writes himself into the story. He describes himself in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John the gospel that he writes, he describes himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. It sounds like an ego trip. It's not. He means it as a very true statement. Can you believe that Jesus would love even me? I wonder what John must have felt. They tell me, they tell me that an eclipse, a full eclipse event is powerfully confusing to wild animals. I mean, can you imagine? You just went to bed, you're a nocturnal creature, a forest woodland creature, and now all of a sudden it's dark again. What in the world is going on? They say the cicadas or the crickets or the nighttime sounds come back. If I wasn't out here on the back lawn with y'all, I'd want to be in the woods that day to experience that, to see that, and to hear that. I bet we'll get to experience some of that even out here. It's pretty cool to think about. It's got to be super confusing for wild animals. Passion Week, Holy Week, was powerfully confusing to Jesus' followers. It was. Let's just walk through the week together, shall we? Even before it began, Friday and Saturday, Jesus shows up with his entourage in the suburbs. They stayed in Bethany, and each day they walked back and forth into Jerusalem over the Mount of Olives. We find him here in Bethany with his followers. Look and see what happens. I'm in John chapter 12. Six days before the Passover, before Thursday night, Jesus arrived at Bethany, Friday we're talking about, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Picture the scene. Lazarus was dead Stone cold, stinking dead. Jesus called him out of the grave. Now he's reclining at the table. If you're one of Jesus' followers, what mixture of hope and weird, like what in the world is this story that I get to be a part of that I'm living right now? Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. I could preach a whole sermon on those few verses. Nard is a funeral spice, powerfully expensive. I'm told it only grows in like Nepal and China, the very, very, very far east, according to this story. It was expensive to get a hold of. It was expensive to have. There's a whole conversation that happens there. Um, Judas, who is the treasurer, he talks about taking care of the poor. And Jesus rebukes him. Yeah, we could have sold this, but what he doesn't say, but we understand through the lens of history looking backwards, she's anointing my body for a funeral. Powerfully confusing. Sunday, Sunday's Palm Sunday, that's the day we celebrate today, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the back. You heard Tony mention this earlier. Not on a powerful steed like a conquering king should ride into the city, but on the back of a donkey. That had to be confusing for Jesus' followers. Hosanna, Hosanna, praise him. 
this fickle crowd what awaits the end of the week? Monday, Monday, they're walking back into the city now over the Mount of Olives. There's this powerfully confusing story that happens. Well, let's just read it together. Mark chapter 11, check this out. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. Hmm. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. All right, there's nothing on it. All right. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. He curses the tree. Interesting. They walk into the city. Uh, there's a temple controversy. Jesus flips over some money changers' tables. He goes back up uh, to the Olivet Discourse on the return. He, has, he preaches a message on the Mount of Olives on the way back to Bethany. This happens on Tuesday. Then, uh, uh, th actually, th th then on Tuesday morning, he gets back up. That was Monday. Tuesday morning, they get up, and they're walking back across the Mount of Olives. And let's see what's, what happened here. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. What? Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. It was alive. Now it's dead. 24 hours later. And then Jesus preaches this message on mountain-moving faith. In my opinion, he's looking across the way at the Herodium. In my opinion, he's actually making a political statement. He's saying, listen, my church has more power to influence the future than even a guy like Herod the Great who could move that mountain, literally cut off the top of a mountain and build up the mountain next to it to make his pleasure palace taller. I think he's making a statement to his disciples that they did not get in that moment. It might have taken days, weeks, months, probably years before they finally went, oh, that's what he was saying. I think they were powerfully confused. Wednesday, Jesus teaches in the temple. Thursday, preparations are made for a Passover meal, then they celebrate a Lord's Supper. We just did that a few minutes ago. There's an upper room discourse. My goodness, read John 15, 16, 17, and see what John has to say about those beautiful moments of intimacy with his Savior. Gethsemane happens Thursday night. You talk about powerfully confusing for the disciples. Wait a minute. I thought we were following a king. He's just been arrested. They take him to a series of trials. There's a Jewish trial on Friday. There are several Jewish trials. There's several Roman trials on Friday. You've got crucifixion and burial. Let's pick up the story here on Friday. Look for John. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, that's John, standing nearby, he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, he said, here's your mother. From that time on, do you get what's going on? He's saying, I'm entrusting my mom to your care, John. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, and so they soaked a sponge in it. They put a sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. He died. Can you imagine the swirling, powerful emotions that John and others must have felt right there in that moment? Saturday, Jesus is in the grave, full eclipse. Where did the sun go? We only know through the benefit of looking backwards at the story, the truth of things like Romans chapter 5, verse 6, you see at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That's you. That's me. In the fullness of time, at just the right time, the celestial plan takes effect. John Jesus gave him purpose. I want you to live this message out. I want you to take care of my mom. Here's a couple of words I would invite you to soak on right now as you think about this. God's grand will for your life. 
the word surrender. Have you fully surrendered yourself to his plan, his purpose? Are you following him with all that you have? How about the word obedience? It's right along with that word surrender. Are you being obedient to his will for your life? Are you in compliance with what he's called you to do? Maybe like John, God has given you a message. He's given you, oh, this is what I'm calling you to do with your life. And are you in compliance with what he's asked you to do? God reveals a grand will. What is he revealing in you? Okay, I told you that there are three of these celestial truths. The first one is that God owns a grand design. The second one is that God reveals a grand will. The third one is that God's design, God's will, is designed to chase away the shadow of doubt. Enter Peter. Here's another one of Jesus' followers. I love the apostle Peter, his impetuousness. I like this guy. He's the kind of guy that jumps and then looks to see what he just jumped into. That night that Jesus is betrayed, Peter is all bluster. Jesus has actually predicted that he's going to deny him, but Peter says, no way, not me. And then it happens. Perhaps you remember this story. It happens late Thursday night, likely Friday morning. He denies Jesus three times, and then the rooster crows. And in that moment, we have recorded for us in Luke chapter 22, verse 61. Check this out. You talk about the shadow of doubt. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. You ever wonder what's in a look? I think that look was powerfully loaded. Jesus turns and looks at Peter at just that moment. A cock's crow, that might not have been a literal rooster. That, kind of, that could have been a shofar that was a trumpet blown on top of the temple calling people to worship. In a moment calling people to worship, Peter realizes that he's just denied Jesus who he's given his life to serve three times. Peter, Jesus called the shot. Peter said, no way, I won't miss. He just missed in a powerful way. Charles Spurgeon has a quote about that moment. I kind of love this quote. He describes this look and he says, I think it was a heart-piercing look, look and a heart-healing look all in one. A look that revealed to Peter the blackness of his sin and also the tenderness of his master's heart toward him. Jesus' look was heart-piercing. Why? Why? Because of sin. The darkness that covers the light. You and I, we struggle with a full eclipse, do we not? Sin. If Peter was susceptible to sin in his life, what makes you think that you are not susceptible to sin in your life? When Jesus looks at you, do you feel a heart piercing look? Well, you should. All through Scripture, we see that moment where people are convicted of their sin, even people like the prophet Isaiah, who says, woe is me, I'm lost, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. That's you and me. For my eyes have seen the king, I've seen the light, and I still choose darkness. I like this quote from John Newton. Speaking of Peter, when the servants spoke to him and said, hey, aren't you with this man, Jesus? And he cussed three times, said, no way. John Newton says, he cursed and he swore. But when Jesus looked upon him, he wept. He was convicted of his sin because Jesus' look was heart piercing. Ah, but Jesus' look was also heart healing. It's the now and the not yet, this whole eclipse idea. We live in darkness, but we can see the light. We can see around that darkness and see the rays of sunlight that Jesus is calling us toward. There's a moment of light breaking free from the shadows when Jesus looks at you. What does he see? Does he see your sin? 
If you've confessed your sin, he's forgiven, and in my opinion, he has forgotten. When he sees you, what he sees is his righteousness, his forgiveness, his redemptive work on the cross. His look is heart healing. I hope you feel that today as well. If you skip ahead in the gospel story, you know the moment when Jesus restores Peter. He denied him three times, but he's asked him three times, do you love me? And three times Peter says, yes. And Jesus gives him a mission as well. He had given John one. He gives Peter one as well, feed my sheep. Tend this movement. Plant churches. Pastor people. And Peter does exactly that. Let me ask you this question. What shadows of doubt are you harboring today? What shadows of doubt do you need to look past, to cast aside, to fix your eyes on the light of Jesus? I did some research. I told you I spent some time on some college websites And I spent some time reading up about the last full solar eclipse and how from the space station they recorded this event. Literally from outer space, they captured this video event. And I watched it. It's amazing what you can find on YouTube. Got me to thinking, how does God view the eclipse event from his perspective? It doesn't catch him by surprise. He knows that it's coming. We've been talking about this item, this this eclipse event being once in your lifetime. And it is. It's once in your lifetime. But could I remind you that this moment when Jesus breaks through the darkness, he beats the power of Satan, sin, death, and hell. Next week we gather together to celebrate that truth together with one another and with your one, whoever you're investing in, whoever you're inviting to come and be a part of that incredible celebration together. At that moment, the light breaking through is once for your lifeline. Your lifeline being today, your death, or when Jesus comes back, whichever one comes first and your eternity that you get to spend together with him in the light, breaking through once for your life line here. So here's how I want to end the message. I want to give you some space, some margin. We talked about this earlier. You heard heard Tony say, we seek Jesus and we see you. We spent some time seeing one another earlier and just laughing together and greeting one another. Right now, could we spend a moment Seeking Jesus. I'm going to give you space to simply soak on what we've just been talking about. I'm going to put up the verse again. And I'm going to invite you to read this passage to soak on the truth. And then after a minute, we'll respond in worship.